So why do you exist? Have you ever asked yourself that? Or better yet, why do you exist right now? Well, there are a number of ways you could answer that, philosophically, scientifically, historically. Biologically speaking, uh, the reason you exist now is because your parents got together and had offspring, who were the offspring of their parents, who were the offspring of their parents, and so on and so on. And this goes back millions of years, and we call this the theory of evolution. Uh, but despite this theory giving us a wealth of information in terms of the biological diversity we see, uh, culturally speaking, it is quite divisive. Many people reject this theory for the consequences they think it creates for why we exist. Instead of being placed on this earth by a creator and endowed with purpose and a plan for our lives, they think evolution teaches we are here by chance and we evolve through a blind process without purpose and meaning. And it's not like many experts have said otherwise. For example, Richard Dawkins has said, evolution has no long-term goal. There is no long-distance target, no final perfection to serve as a criterion for selection. Although human vanity cherishes the absurd notion that our species is the final goal of evolution. Paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould once said, we are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age. Because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for higher answers, but none exists. We'll come back to gold later on. So, if you go into a church or a mosque and you ask them why they reject the theory of evolution, you might get an answer that believing in evolution means we have no purpose. It means we have no value, no moral worth. We are just a biological accident. And because of this, a cultural war has kind of broken out with the narrative being you either accept science and the philosophical worldview that we have no purpose and no meaning, or you have to reject evolution and hold to some intelligent design theory that life was supernaturally created. And then you can save your innate beliefs that we have purpose, meaning, and value. But are we really stuck with just these two options? I would argue no, and that there's a third option. Yes, life is the product of natural processes. We evolve from a common ancestor, but evolution doesn't necessarily mean we are the result of a blind process, that there's no final goal, no teleology, no overall guiding process. So think of the periodic table of elements. Uh, after the Big Bang, all that existed was hydrogen. Then over a long period of time, the universe brought about a plethora of elements. But this was not random luck or just a dumb chance. Certain physical laws constrain molecules to bring about the elements we have now. In other words, if you understood how the laws of nature worked moments after the Big Bang, you could predict the elements on the periodic table that came about naturally. Likewise, when it comes to life within the past few decades, we are finding more and more evidence the process of evolution and abiogenesis are very constrained processes. And life may not be a happy accident, but an inevitable result of the universe itself. So, if you were to rewind the tape of life, start over billions of years ago, on the view that evolution was an unguided, blind process, you wouldn't get life as we know it again. You'd probably get something very different. On the view I'm proposing, if you were wound the tape of life and started over, you would get humans again, or at least something very similar. If you did it again, the same result would happen again and again. So, let's begin by going back before evolution, back to the origin of life, and this is called abiogenesis. Okay? Was this purely a random accident? Did everything that life needs to begin to exist just fall into the right place at the right time? Well, we're not really sure entirely how life began, but what we're finding out is suggesting it was highly constrained by natural law. For example, Jeremy England and his co-researchers have theorized life may be an inevitable result of the laws of thermodynamics. According to England and his co-researchers, after running several computer simulations, they found molecules in rare cases will naturally structure and self-organize in order to deal with rare pockets of energy. In other words, different chemicals organize. 
and react with one another in order to better absorb incoming energy, like from the sun, and then dissipate it as heat. So the very laws of physics that tell us atoms will build structures in order to better process energy, but such systems do resemble life as we are consuming creatures that take in and burn off energy. And these could be the first clues to how the first molecules began to build towards the first single-celled organism. But this was not a fluke of nature. It was inevitable in certain conditions. As England told Quanta in 2014, life should be as unsurprising as rocks rolling downhill. But even before England, we've known other uh, constraints in nature that would fine-tune the process of evolution in abiogenesis. As far back as the 1980s, scientists were aware of self-assembly processes that brought about the existence of protocells. And this is a, a very important step towards the origin of life. But once again, such structures were the result of self-assembly processes in nature, not chemical accidents. Another study ran successful computer simulations of, chem of what chemical interactions would have been like in a prebiotic world. Complex behavior resulted without the existence of genes. And the researchers observed highly constrained monomer rep repertoires and in intricate polymer chemistry as seen in living cells. Then in 2013, another exciting discovery found that RNA-like molecules can spontaneously assemble into gene-like chains. And this could have been a primitive form of genetic information that could have eventually evolved into RNA and then DNA. Now, the whole origin of life question has not been fully solved, don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of signposts pushing us in the direction that life wasn't necessarily a fluke or a pure accident, or that it was too complex to naturally come about and we need supernatural creation. Instead, we're seeing this idea that the first single-celled organisms to emerge may have been inevitable, just from the laws of nature. Now, once we get life, we see more evidence that evolution from there on out was constrained. Let's compound all this data with the work of two chemists who wrote a paper perfectly titled, Evolution Was Chemically Constrained. They have argued thermodynamics and the rules of chemistry uh, constrain and bring about an inevitable progression in the direction of evolution. There are principles of constraint and the nature of intercellular reductive chemistry, the challenge of oxygen, and the cooperative interactions within ecosystems. They conclude their paper by saying that life was in a physical tunnel and there was only one way to go. There's a lot of evidence the nature of protein folds are a, na a natural product of amino acid assembly and constrained by a law-like behavior to form into specific biological structures necessary for life. So in other words, the rise of the various protein folds necessary for life to exist seem to be a result of natural laws. Let me just quote two researchers on this. Although sequences and functionalities of proteins evolve, the folds they adopt, which in turn determine function, seem to be determined by physical law and are not subject to Darwinian evolution. In that regard, these folds may be thought of as immutable or platonic. Protein folds do not evolve. Rather, the menu of possible folds is determined by physical law. So what we see is an essential building block for life was already written into the fabric of the universe. And I want to remind you all, there are dozens of additional examples I could go over. The more we research the origin of life and evolution, the more likely it is that life was written into the laws of nature. In other words, just like you could predict the periodic table if you understood all of the laws of physics entirely, in theory, you should also be able to predict that life would come about and that nature would direct it down a certain path. Now, if there are so many constraints in evolution, how does this affect the life, how does this affect life as we see in the thousands of species today? Well, Evolution mainly works through divergence. This is when a population of species split off and diverged down two different paths. But what we also see is hundreds of cases of convergence. This is where similar function, functions, structures, and forms keep appearing in nature. Basically, if nature is fine-tuned to bring about certain structures and biological functions, then we should expect to see the same forms repeating. <laughs> 
and in, we have found dozens upon dozens of examples of convergence. This is, again, this is when two organisms, not closely related, evolve the same traits, structures, or features. So, it seems that if an organism enters an environment, there are specific constraints that determine how the organism will evolve. So let's uh, take a look at these two guys, okay? Both are sloths, and yet they cannot reproduce. Well, why? Well, one is a three-toed sloth, and the other is a two-toed sloth. Now, you'd think just by looking at them that their species are cousins or that they're closely related, but in fact, they're not. They're actually pretty distant, uh, but both evolved or converged to arrive at the same structure and form. This is another interesting example. Uh, this one, one of them is a hummingbird, and the other is an insect known as a hawk moth. But once again, they converged to the same form because they both entered the same ecological niche. Now, next up, we have camera eyes, which evolved invertebrates. You, I, everyone today has camera eyes. This is a very complex structure. But camera eyes have actually evolved multiple times along different divergent lines. Here's one of my favorite examples, because I love cats. This is the African cheetah. And you might not be aware of it, but thousands of years ago, there was an American cheetah. Uh, the two actually evolved independently and yet are almost identical. So Daniel Adams writes, the points of similarity are so extensive that such a complex nature that a hypothesis attributing their pricing to other than common genetic descent would require pushing the concept of parallel evolution to an unprecedented extreme. Uh, here's another fascinating chart uh, with examples of parallel evolution between placenta mammals and marsupials. Now, as you can see, similar forms keep appearing along completely different lines. Paleontologist Simon Conway Morris has basically published several books uh, that just list the examples of convergence we find in nature. Uh, this one pic book pictured here is a 450-page book of hundreds of examples of convergence. It is astronomical the amount of convergence we find. But once again, if nature is fine-tuned to constrain life and only go in certain directions, this is what we would expect. And this is merely a fraction of the evidence that I could cover. But if you really dive into the data, it truly becomes hard to deny that, in some sense, the evolution of life must have been heavily constrained and directed. Remember in the beginning that I quoted uh, the paleontologist Stephen uh, Jay Gould on the implications of a purely random, unguided theory of evolution? Well, it's not like Gould ever became religious or spiritual. Okay? But in terms of how he thought of evolution, his views did evolve. Uh, just before he died, he said this, I work piecemeal, producing a set of separate and continually accreting revisionary items along each of the branches of Darwinian central logic until I realized that a platonic something up there in ideological space could coordinate all these critiques and fascinations into a revised general theory with a retained Darwinian base. In other words, the process of evolution could very easily be explained as a guided process by natural law, not something that is purely blind or random. So when it comes to us as humans, I think it is incorrect to say that we are just fortunate apes here by chance. To quote the physicist Freeman John Dyson, the more I examine the universe and the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. And I think if you study the evidence of the fine-tuning in physics, as well as, what we went over, as well as what we went over today in terms of biology and chemistry, it is hard to deny that the universe must have known we were coming. But also, we could suggest the universe was meant to shape us into what we are now. So where does this leave us? Well, going back to the cultural divide I mentioned at the beginning, I suggest a way forward where we can have our cake and eat it too. It is scientifically true to say that life evolved from a single-celled organism billions of years ago. But it is false to claim that this theory implies we're the products of chance or a blind process devoid of purpose and meaning. We can have a theory of evolution that is consistent and compatible with the belief that we are here for a reason. Now, I'm not saying this proves that this is the case. It is beyond the scope of science to say either or. But if you believe there is design in nature, and if you believe there is a reason for life, 
This is perfectly compatible with the theory of evolution. Evolution could very well be the method or design plan used to bring us about. And that we're not just products of chance or a blind process, as someone like Richard Dawkins will tell you. So, going back to my original question, why are you here? Well, it could be because of a fluke or a blind process, but it could also be because you were meant to be. And that belief is perfectly compatible with the theory of evolution. Thank you.